Welcome to module three of the series entitled Current Treatment Limitations and Clinical Needs in Early Alzheimer's Disease. My name is Dr. Mark McGrone, and I'm a geriatric psychiatrist. I serve as the Senior Vice President for Behavioral Health at Miami Jewish Health in Miami, Florida. I'm also the Chief Medical Officer of the Mind Institute at Miami Jewish Health, which is a memory disorder center. I'm joined uh, here uh, again with my colleague and friend, Dr. Richard Isaacson. He's the Director of the Alzheimer's Prevention Clinic and an Associate Professor of Neurology, as well as the Assistant Dean for Faculty Development at Weill Cornell Medicine in New York Presbyterian in New York City. So Dr. Isaacson, welcome to the program. Yep, thanks so much for having me and look forward to the discussion. Absolutely. Uh, I'm disclosing here, I do some consultant work for Biogen and Eli Lilly. Dr. Isaacson does not have any disclosures. The program is provided by the North American Center for Continuing Medical Education, an HMP company, and it's supported by an educational grant from Biogen. Uh, today, we will outline the pharmacotherapeutic approaches for the treatment of cognitive and neuropsychiatric symptoms in early Alzheimer's disease, and we'll explain the clinical need for improved medications for the treatment of early Alzheimer's disease. So obviously, if we're looking at what are we trying to achieve in terms of treatment for a disease that currently is incurable. If we do nothing over time, obviously a person will continue to progressively uh, decline in terms of cognition and function. We know this is how we define the clinical course of Alzheimer's disease. We'll talk about certain medications. There are four FDA medications that can bring some degree of symptomatic benefit. So they don't slow the course of the disease per se. They push someone into a better symptomatic picture over time even as they continue to decline. There's a lot of work that we'll talk about in ongoing modules about trying to modify the disease to slow the progression of Alzheimer's disease. And ultimately we wanna cure, we wanna arrest this disease in its tracks and this tremendous amount of research towards that end. And when it comes to the treatment of Alzheimer's disease, there are really two different approaches or two different kind of frameworks that I think we need to think about. Um, because uh, on the right part of this slide, there's symptomatic improvement. And, you know, our goal is to use whatever's available currently, FDA approved treatments, acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, as well as an NMDA antagonist uh, medication that shows that, well, we can't really reverse symptoms. We can't really arrest symptoms and there's no disease modification. At least we can have some degree of symptomatic benefit. And even, you know, some studies have shown delayed nursing home placement and, you know, easier outcomes from a neuropsychiatric perspective. So these are things that I think are really warrant a consideration and treatment, especially, um, you know, th honestly throughout the course of the disease, but there's no uh, significant evidence that these agents work outside of Alzheimer's disease, except for one uh, cholinesterase inhibitor that's also approved for Parkinson's disease, dementia. But the take home point here is, you know, these are not miracle drugs, but they should be used in, 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 in you know, clinical practice. When it comes to disease modification, this is really hopefully going to be a whole new world where most therapies are aimed at slowing down the buildup of beta amyloid plaques or tau tangles. Um, and there's a variety of clinical trials, um, antibody immunotherapy, cerebral metabolic enhancement, trying to boost glucose uh, hypometabolism, which is something we've talked about, anti-aggregation approaches, neuroprotection, and even stem cells. I think, you know, we're a little ways off there, but we're, we're really making progress. And the fact that these are in trials uh, is certainly exciting. Yeah, so many different approaches which are being focused on. But in terms of what we have available now, uh, there's, there's two categories, as Dr. Isaacson mentioned. First, there are the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, denepazil, rivastigmine, and galantamine. And these all work the same, which is why we put someone only on one of these. They block an enzyme called acetylcholinesterase, which breaks down acetylcholine. And that's the main uh, neurotransmitter needed for learning and memory. Uh, and then we have memantine, which is the glutamate receptor antagonist, it comes in different forms. It even comes in a combination with denepazil. It's a different mechanism of action. It prevents the overactivity of glutamate in the brain, which we know is associated with neuronal damage and even death. The one thing I wanna emphasize when we look at dosing here is that we have to get the person's body and brain acclimate, acclimated to these medications. So we have a starting dose and we slowly titrate over the course of four weeks to get to the therapeutic range, but we do wanna to get to the therapeutic range because those ranges are associated with uh, the most significant improvement symptomatically. And again, I wanna emphasize that these help to improve symptoms and because we have two different mechanisms. We can actually combine 
one acetylcholinesterase inhibitor with memantine. Yeah, and I, I agree. Um, the starting low and go slow approach is so important. Um, and, you know, little tricks of the trade, um, you know, taking the medication, for example, if it's a pill, a cholinesterase inhibitor, taking it with some food, you know, that's, that's one way to, you know, reduce some of the side effects. And, and these are, these are things, again, in practice that I think, um, you know, we, we should all um, think about and consider. Um, when it comes to kind of the model of cognitive benefit, um, you know, there's just, you know, over a hundred randomized controlled trials and there's a, you know, really important meta-analyses out there um, that show that um, if we do use these agents, um, we can at least have some tangible degree of impact in something called the ADAS-COG, which is the Alzheimer's Disease Assessment Scale Cognitive Subscore. And that score is uh, really used for most uh, dementia trials, uh, most uh, symptomatic dementia trials, uh, where we can actually show um, an, a separation or an improvement uh, when it comes uh, to placebo. Um, and also even in open label extensions, um, the improvement uh, compared to placebo continues and even compared to no treatment continues. But there is, of course, a steady decline, um, no matter what you do, and the patient will kind of return back to their baseline, give or take uh, at about a year, but they would have done much worse if they weren't on these medications. Yeah, that's the key. As you said, there's so many studies that shows convincing evidence these work. We know the medications are not a cure all. Sometimes you can see the difference, sometimes not, but the data is really clear. And that's really what we go on in terms of prescribing these medications. And in addition, we really focus on combination therapy. So if you look at no medication, again, you're going to see that slow but steady progressive decline, which is the hallmark of Alzheimer's disease. You improve symptomatically if you put someone on monotherapy with a cholinesterase inhibitor. This is really good data from our colleague, uh, Dr. Autry, who looked over four years individuals on combination therapy and basically found a significant difference in terms of their symptomatic picture. So this is why we really push for combination therapy for everyone once they get into a moderate to severe stage of this illness. Even in severe stages, we know that there can be significant differences symptomatically, and that can be really meaningful for individuals and their caregivers. So when it comes to these types of cognitive enhancing medications, um, there's definitely some do's and don'ts because keeping expectations uh, high is a, is a recipe for failure. Um, you can't say that these drugs are going to be a cure-all. Um, you know, in, in my practice, like, like Mark said, uh, some people improve a little bit, some people seem to stabilize, and some people you can throw the kitchen sink out and, um, you know, they just, you just, people are just not going to budge and they're going to continue to decline. Well, we can't overpromise. You have to kind of promise not to overpromise if you're going to be successful. Uh, but you can educate patients and caregivers um, about the potential for benefit. But you also, of course, for fair balance, need to talk about the side effects and, of course, make realistic expectations. Like I mentioned earlier, start low and go slow. Uh, my mom taught me Rome wasn't built in a day. Uh, this disease develops literally over decades. So you can take an extra couple of weeks or a couple of months even to try to get on that uh, more maximal therapeutic dose. Uh, I agree with Mark, um, the higher doses can certainly give some higher benefit. But of course, what happens sometimes, the higher the dose, the larger the chance for side effects. Um, when it comes to um, using acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, um, don't combine them. Um, there's just zero evidence for that. Um, I've uh, maybe once or twice had, a, had, had patients that were on two different ones for a variety of different reasons. And, uh, you know, it's only happened a few times, but every time there was uh, some degree of uh, gastrointestinal side effects. Um, when it comes to combining acetylcholinesterase inhibitors with memantine, that's a do, especially honestly for FDA uh, uh, regulations. Uh, is, uh, memantine is FDA approved for the combination therapy of moderate to severe Alzheimer's disease. So it's something important to keep in mind. Definitely monitor for, for side effects and um, do start early. Um, you know, just just waiting till the moderate stages. You know, it's just get, give people the best you know quality of life, meaningful uh, ch likelihood of meaningful change and, and and degree of stability earlier in the course because that's that's really when their best years and their best moments are. Yeah, such such key points, especially because there are important side effects you need to know about. Cholinesterase inhibitors and a certain percentage of individuals. 5-10% sometimes can cause some significant GI side effects, raising, ranging from loss of appetite, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Uh, some people can get dizziness. Uh, theoretically, because you're affecting a cholinergic function, you could exacerbate uh, cardiac arrhythmias, particularly bradycardia. 
Uh, if someone has a lot of pulmonary secretions, you can sometimes exacerbate that. These are pretty predictable. And as, as Dr. Eisen had mentioned before, sometimes giving with food, keeping the dose low, going slow can mitigate these and they can get better over time. Some people just don't tolerate them. Uh, that's why we have, we have memantine, which you can also give uh, either monotherapy or ideally combination. Uh, some people have a little bit of almost fogginess or confusion that gets better over time. And it's important to educate patients and caregivers about that so they don't think they're getting worse. Some people can be a little sedation. We tend to give it at night. And uh, some people can have some mild constipation, but in general, it's pretty well tolerated. And when it comes to an initial management approach for older adults uh, with changes in behavior or changes in personality, um, it's really important to take a really detailed history, evaluate the symptoms. When did they start? How have they progressed? Um, it's essential to get collateral history from you know, different family members, uh, not just the spouse, but a, but a, a daughter, a son, a friend, um, understanding that there are you know, different, different, these different perspectives are gonna give you um, really a, a better understanding of, of how to treat, like which, which symptoms to treat. Someone may be agitated or someone have, may have a change in behavior or personality, but does it always happen Stereotyp stereotyped at the same time of day? Is there something that triggers it? Is it when they leave the house? Is it more of a sundowning situation? Is it the response to a medicine or is it the response to someone who agitates them, a caregiver or a paid caregiver that maybe they don't feel comfortable with? These are all really important questions to ask to get to the bottom of it. Uh, because before you want to start a medicine, you always want to try to eliminate the problem if there's something that is a non-pharmacological or behavioral intervention that can be done. Um, brief cognitive testing is, is really key. Um, sometimes, of course, you'll need full neuropsych testing. Um, you may have to repeat uh, blood work, uh, neuroimaging, you know, to evaluate, is this progression or is this something else? You know, most of the time that someone calls me, um, you know, I have women, women call, uh, actually it was on Sunday night, uh, someone, the daughter emailed me, I talked to them on, on Monday morning, and the woman ended up having a urinary tract infection. And by far, that's just, you know, I would say at least, I don't know, up to 75% of the time or more when someone acutely worsens, it's a toxic metabolic or infectious cause. So they'll need to see their primary care doctor rather than coming to me uh, initially uh, for, for some sort of treatment. So the key here is um, treat, if you, if you can treat the medical comorbidity, of course, first, um, consider support when needed. And, um, you know, sometimes you have to refer. I'm, I'm a neurologist. I know what my limits are. I'll refer. We have lots of patients that I'm still, still referring to Dr. Agron and in Miami, we still share patients uh, across across the coast, um, but uh, it's these are really important symptoms to to recognize. It's true, and sometimes we find this is the bulk of our management because uh, doing the you know you do the initial workup, you get them on a cognitive enhancing medication, but all these other symptoms crop up because the brain is being damaged, and uh, so the earlier you're into being, the more effective, the more you work as a team, it really can make a difference. So, thank you so much for. Uh, listening into the module today. Uh, just a reminder to, complete, to please complete the post-activity question. And we'd love you to join us for module four of the series entitled Emerging Treatments for Early Alzheimer's Disease, focusing on the mechanisms of action.